Awesome. Well, in this series, throughout the book of Acts, every single week we are looking at the phenomenon of what God did through the early church, and it really is a phenomenon. At no other time in human history has there ever been an ideology or even a religion that has spread as vastly, as exponentially, and as comprehensively as Christianity, and, and there's been no other religion that's done it in the way that the Christians did it, because it's the only religion, it's the only worldview, it's the only ideology that has spread where its leaders were not in positions of social standing or power. This is a group of nobodies, a ragtag group of nobodies that were simply willing to be used by God, that were chosen by God for a specific purpose. And what's incredible is they turned the first century world upside down, and we today are here because of their faithfulness and obedience to what God was telling them to do. And so far we've seen in, uh, in the book of Acts that these early followers received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and received supernatural power to accomplish the mission that God had set out for them to accomplish, and they were continually filled with the Holy Spirit. We've seen an incredible commitment to the truth, no matter what it cost these early followers personally. We, we've seen that they uh, were absolutely committed to being witnesses for Christ, to literally being martyrs for Christ, to laying down their lives as a living sacrifice. We've talked about their ability, that God empowered them to endure horrendous hardship and persecution far more than we can possibly imagine here in America horrendous persecution and how the church continually met a hostile culture with love toward their enemies, blessing those who were persecuting them and cursing them, and doing this all while not uh, wavering on the truth of the word of God. Pastor Dave last week did an excellent job drawing out how these early followers walked not in the fear of man but in the fear of the Lord and draw some, he drew some incredible applications to our lives personally, talking about the benefits of walking in the fear of the Lord, incredibly important for us. And today we're jumping into the events that led to the first Christian martyr. His name is Stephen. It's an incredible story, and it's an incredibly epic story, but before we jump into our passage, just a bit of background for us. In Acts chapter six, the disciples, the, the, the early apostles, they were devoted to uh, teaching the word and to prayer. And what ended up happening in the early church is uh, there were disadvantaged people in the church that were unintentionally being overlooked. There were widows that were being overlooked in the daily distributions to meeting needs. And so what the apostles did, because they were wearing too many hats, there were people falling through the cracks, balls were getting dropped, and so they appointed, they chose and appointed seven men to the task of serving these widows that were being overlooked. And as they did this, uh, these seven men, as they served and met needs, they also began to preach the gospel and works, God was doing signs and wonders through them as well. But there's an important leadership principle for us here and, and there's an important just general principle for the church body as a whole. Number one, the fact that they're delegating responsibility so no one falls through the cracks is incredibly important. And what we see here is that word ministry without deed ministry is weak ministry. If we have all the knowledge of the scriptures and can proclaim the truth of the scriptures, but we don't combine that with actually allowing the scriptures to work its way out in how we live and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, then it's an empty witness for Christ. Because you can talk a good talk, but if you don't walk the walk, then it doesn't matter. If we don't reflect Christ in our daily lives, we actually have no business in proclaiming the words of Christ to a hurting world. James says it pretty plainly. He says, faith without works is dead. It's an important lesson for us uh, that we see in the early church. So they chose these men to serve, and the first man that they chose was Stephen. And before long, God was doing great things through Stephen's, uh, not only his service, but through his words and working miracles through his life. And Stephen caused such a commotion 
among the religious leaders, uh, among the Jewish religious leaders, that they ended up conspiring against him, uh, making up uh, false accusations about him, and arresting him and bringing him before the Sanhedrin so he could be questioned by the high priest. Now, just a side note, what's interesting about this is some scholars believe that the high priest that would have presided over Stephen's arrest and interrogation was Caiaphas, who was the same high priest that would have presided over Jesus' arrest and his interrogation. And so the high priest asked Stephen to respond to his accusations, respond to his accusers. And what's interesting is Stephen, instead of responding directly to the accusations, he gives them a Bible lesson. He gives them a summary of the entire Old Testament in his message. I mean, it's all of Acts chapter seven. I think it's 53 verses. I'm not gonna read the whole thing for you. Everybody said, praise God. I'm not gonna read all of it to you. What I am gonna do is give you a, a summary overview of his summary of the Old Testament. And it's broken up into five specific sections. And, and here's the thing, just to, to give you a heads up on this. You know, I've said this before. Some messages are um, more preachy and some messages are more teachy and this one's gonna be a bit more teachy, so just hang in there with me. All right, so Stephen caused this commotion, the high priest is asking him, he gives a summary of the Old Testament, and uh, Stephen is driving home a number of themes in his response to the Sanhedrin, and it's broken up into five sections. The first section is Stephen outlines the promises to Abraham in verses two through eight. He begins by reminding the religious leaders and just remember, these guys would have been the ones who knew the scriptures better than anybody else. And here's Stephen giving them a, a Bible lesson, a history lesson <laughs> throughout the Old Testament. So Stephen drives home the point that the promises that were made to Abraham came outside of the land of Israel. It came outside of the Holy Land, and Abraham never owned so much as a foot of ground in the actual land of Israel. And what Stephen is doing here is he's beginning a critique of what the Jewish leaders, this ideology that the, the, the Jewish leaders had of Jewish nationalism. The idea that God was somehow confined to the land of Israel and additionally somehow confined to the temple. That because they built the temple that God was limited to operating just in the ways that they thought and understood. And so Stephen is going, hey, this is crazy to even think that you could build a house for God that would somehow confine him and limit him from doing what he wants to do. And later in Acts chapter seven, he says it plainly. He says it like this in verse 47. He says, but it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the most high does not dwell in houses made by hands. As the prophet said, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? I love those moments in scripture where you can just feel the sarcasm sort of coming from God. Like, I'm God. What kind of house are you gonna make for me? Right, you, 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 you think I'm gonna dwell in a house and limit myself in a house made by human hands? The earth is my throne. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Right, and so God is just saying, in, in your commitment to religiously following all of these things, many of the, the laws and rules and rituals you've made up on your own, you have, you have such a narrow view of who I am and what I'm about and the things that I'm going to do in the world. And so Stephen begins to sort of dismantle this belief around uh, Jewish nationalism. The second thing that we see is the sojourn of Joseph in verses nine through 16. He continued by pointing out how God had delivered Israel through Joseph. And again, this happened outside of the Holy Land. And then we see the beginnings of a second theme arise in verse nine. He says, and the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt and God was with him. Now this is not a proud moment for Israel because this is the heads of the 12 tribes selling Joseph into slavery. And 
through the sovereign work of God, Joseph ends up delivering Israel and saving Israel. And again, all of this is happening outside of the land of Israel, right? And the second theme that's drawn out here is that Stephen is telling the Sanhedrin over and over and over and over again throughout the history of God's people, they continually rejected and repeatedly rejected the people that I have chosen and sent to Israel to deliver my message. You've continually persecuted them, you have cast them out, you've sold them into slavery, you have repeatedly rejected the people that I have sent to you, right? And again, he's setting this up because in a moment he's gonna turn the corner and direct this specifically at the religious leaders. The third section is about Moses, the deliverance of Israel through Moses, verses 17 uh, through 34. And Stephen spends uh, the most amount of time on Moses. It falls into three specific sections, his early years, his uh, birth, him being raised in the house of Pharaoh. The second section, verses 23 through 29, um, cover the 40 years uh, between Moses' original flight and departure from Egypt and then his calling to return at the uh, burning bush. And then the final section of Moses' life, which is the exodus and the wilderness wandering leading uh, the, the people to the, the, the promised land. Now again, the same two themes are prominent in this section as well. God was with Israel in a very special way. Should I eat it? I think that's caramel popcorn. Somebody was snacking up there, I guess. Manna from heaven, that's right. (laughs) Thank you, Lord. That's never happened before. Okay, so the same two themes are, I'm I'm gonna, I've gotta create some kind of like memorial for this thing. I'm gonna put it up, put it up in my office. All right, so the same two themes are prominent. God was with Israel in a special way outside of the promised land and Israel continued uh, rejecting its leaders over and over and over again. And uh, this fourth section is really where Stephen turns a corner and and lets them have it. So the fourth section is the apostasy of Israel in verses 35 through 50. And specifically in verses 44 through 47, Stephen starts going after the practices in the temple. And he essentially says this, and this, I mean, you gotta think about Stephen is talking to individuals that literally hold his life in the balance. And he goes after the fact that Israel did a better job of worshiping God in the wilderness when they had a a tent of meeting that was portable and able to move with them whenever they were traveling and move from place to place, that they did a better job worshiping God in the wilderness than they ever have in Solomon's temple. And it reveals that at least some of the accusations made against Stephen were accurate. He was critiquing the practices of the temple. He was going after the practices that were happening there. And he did speak against the way Israel approached their religious practices in the temple because it was supposed to be a house of prayer, but it had become so dogmatic and so rigid in how they were approaching God and, uh, and the belief that God was exclusively accessible to the land of Israel and the temple uh, th- through the methods and means of the temple. This is why Stephen asks them, how in the world could the temple be God's only dwelling place when God himself says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool? And see, I, I think the reminder for us here, and this, this is an important reminder for us, is that God is infinitely bigger, grander, more majestic and powerful, more present, infinitely more. It's what Jonathan was talking about, God being transcendent. He is so far above and outside what we can possibly fathom or comprehend in our finite human minds. And this is a reminder to us that whenever we get so rigid in our belief system that we expect God to only operate within these parameters, we've limited God and no longer have God, but we have an idol made in our own image. Yeah. 
right? This, this is the thing. God doesn't live in houses made by human hands. He is outside of what we can fathom or understand. And what's, what's often true, and I, I hate that this is reality, but what's often true is we as Christians, especially we as religious people, we're never confronted by our God or never challenged by our God. And if you live in a world where you are never challenged by the God that you follow or believe in, what you, don't ha what you have is not God, what you have is an idol. If your God aligns with all your ideas, opinions, and ideologies, you do not have God, you have an idol made in your own image. Right? The God of Scripture continually confronts his people and confronts their wrong ideas about him. And that's what's happening with the Sanhedrin. Stephen is going, hey guys, you have limited God. You think God only operates like this, but God is so much bigger than that, and they didn't want to hear it. They plugged their ears. They didn't want to hear it, and this is what he's going after. And again, they hold Stephen's life in the balance, and he is signing his own death warrant. And the fifth section, he just cranks it up a whole lot and he begins talking about the rejection of the Messiah in verses 51 through 53. This is a direct assault on the Sanhedrin. And here's what he says starting in verse 51. He says, you stiff-necked people. That's a great start. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, speaking of Jesus, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. I mean, their job the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, their job was to keep the law and keep their eyes on the horizon so that they might identify the Messiah when he comes on the scene. And Stephen is going, not only did you not keep the law and not only did you fail miserably, you had one job, you failed miserably identifying the Messiah, but you murdered the Messiah that God sent. I mean, he just rips into these guys. And What's amazing is the boldness and the courage that he had. And my prayer for us, church, is that we would have that same courage and boldness when the moment demands it. That when the opportunity arises to speak the truth out of love, because he's not ripping into them just to rip into them. He's ripping into them for the hope that their hard hearts might be softened and they might come to repent and believe on the only Son of God, Jesus Christ. That's why he's saying this. And he's saying, it was your sole responsibility to do this one thing, and you have failed. Now, all of this begs a question for us, because the Sanhedrin, there were certain things in their world that were sacred to them. Their position, their influence, their authority, their status, they did not want to let those things go. Those were their sacred things. And it begs the question for us, what are your sacred things? What are the good things in your life that you have elevated to become ultimate things? What are the idols in your life? Because the Sanhedrin, even though Stephen just gave them this comprehensive step-by-step walkthrough of the history of God's dealings with Israel and it all being fulfilled in the person of Jesus, they would not have it. And it's not that they wouldn't listen and, or that they didn't want to hear it. It's beyond that. It was, they were set on cutting off and destroying the lives of anybody that told them something they did not want to hear. And so the question for us Maybe the question for you are, what are the things in your life that you are unwilling to allow God to change? What is it in your life that you are clinging to because you would be absolutely crushed if God told you to let it go? 
What are your idols? Because as we've said before, the thing that you are currently most defensive about is most likely the thing that you worship the most. The thing that you're clinging to for security. So what are your sacred things? And that was revealed in the lives of the religious leaders as Stephen is bringing this to them because they wouldn't hear it and their response to his message we see in Acts chapter seven verses 54 through the beginning of chapter eight. It says, now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud vo voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, and Saul approved of his execution. A few things here. One, this is such a beautiful moment in the life of the early church. It's such an epic moment in the life of the early church and what's incredible is Stephen, while his enemies are literally killing him, he prays for their forgiveness. He looks just like Jesus. We're also introduced to Saul for the first time who we know as the Apostle Paul who wrote many of the writings of the New Testament. We'll be talking more about him in weeks to come but here he is approving of the killing of Stephen. And in later chapters we see that Literally, the air around Saul was seething with animosity and rage and death toward these early followers of Christ. And his life was about to radically change. The other thing we see here is the religious leaders actually didn't realize what they were doing when they killed Stephen, when they martyred this man. Because the result of Stephen's martyrdom as the first Christian martyr, the result of his martyrdom was the dispersion of the early disciples outside of Jerusalem. So the martyrdom of Stephen is the impetus for the early church going to Judea and Samaria. So we saw the outline in Acts uh, chapter one, verse eight, where it says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. So this is that moment that caused the early followers to go outside of Jerusalem and go into Judea and Samaria. So the, the martyrdom of Stephen sparked this dispersion and the spreading of the gospel. But one of the most beautiful things about this passage is the fact that Stephen laid down his life for the sake of the gospel and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Do you know that every other time in scripture that Jesus is described as being at the right hand of the Father, he's described as sitting. This is the only moment in scripture where it says that Jesus was standing at the right hand of the Father. See, where Saul is described as standing in approval over Stephen's death, Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father in approval of Stephen's life. It's this moment where he's looking at Stephen and he's going, well done, that's my son. He's mine and look at his obedience and his faithfulness and I'm gonna use his sacrifice to spark this revolution in a way that never would have happened without it. It's absolutely beautiful, the challenge for us church, the invitation from God to us is will we live lives of obedience and radical faithfulness and self-sacrifice in a way that causes Jesus to stand at the right hand of the Father? Will we live lives of courage for the sake of the gospel like Stephen? Stephen, not just in his message, but in his methodology, in his actions, 
not just in word. He represents Jesus well. We see that Stephen was willing to die to lay down his life for the sake of the gospel. And though short of literal martyrdom, nothing we live through will compare to what Stephen had to endure or even what followers of Christ still to this day, the persecution that they endure around the world for their faith. But there is a principle here that is worth discussing. What are we willing to die for? What are some things that we will never compromise on? What are some things that we will stand on no matter what sort of opposition we face in life? And well, I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's been just a couple of rumors spreading about Grace Chapel recently. That's a joke. <laughs> and, uh, and some of those have been directed specifically at me, and as the pastor of Grace Chapel, I want you to know, I want you to know that there are things that I will die for. There are hills that I am willing to die on and will die on. There are things that I will never compromise on no matter what opposition or animosity I personally face or we face collectively as the body of Christ. Whether it's opposition from outside or within, there are things that I will never compromise on and I want you to know, and this will prove out over time, but I wanna state clearly what those things are. Are. Number one, without apology, I will preach the full counsel of the word of God. From Genesis to Revelation. From the creation account to the second coming of Christ and everything in between, I will preach the full counsel of the word of God. Where the Bible speaks, I will speak. Where the Bible is silent, I will remain silent. Because the only authority on which I have built my entire life over the last 18 years of knowing Christ is the words written in this book. This is the only authority I have. Outside of the words on these pages, I have no authority and I will remain silent. If you want to know my opinion about something, come ask me. But I will not preach authoritatively on the opinions of men. I'm going to speak boldly the words of God. Without apology, I will be faithful in doing the work of a pastor. And it is my deep conviction, based on the words of scripture, that it is the job and calling of a pastor to be a servant. To be a servant. To humbly and faithfully lay down your life for the sake of the sheep that God has entrusted to you to care for. That is the calling of a pastor. And I'm absolutely committed to doing that work for the sake of Grace Chapel. It is my deep personal conviction that in the midst of a world full of churches that are abdicating biblical orthodox Christianity, that are adopting all kinds of worldviews and ideas that are the antithesis of the teachings of scripture and cowing to the demands of a pagan culture, Grace Chapel will hold firm to orthodox biblical Christianity and the doctrine that has been held to and taught by the church long before Grace Chapel ever existed. The, the conservative theology, and for those of you that are wondering, I am also politically conservative as well, but the conservative theology that has been instilled in me by men like Bill Spencer, Steve Berger, Dave Buring, and a whole bunch of other faithful men of God. Those things will not waver or pander to or bow down to the demands of culture and we're gonna do this while still offering hope, love, and compassion to a broken world desperately in need of the gospel. 
I will continue to fulfill the calling of God on my life to make disciples that make disciples, plant churches that plant new churches, paving the way and making room to develop the next generation of pastors, leaders, missionaries, kingdom-centered businessmen and women, right? This is the work of the pastor. It's not because it's a good strategy crafted by human minds, but because it is the command of scripture and the commission of Christ that I do this work. And we see this clearly as we're working our way through the book of Acts. This is what the church was about and this is what we are going to be about. Stephen laid down his life for the sake of the gospel. And I will do the same with whatever life I have left on this earth. And I will lay down my life to see the Grace Chapel family healed and whole again. I will spend the life that God has given me to that end because that is the calling of God on my life as the pastor of this church. I will fulfill, by the grace of God, I will fulfill that calling. Because this is the calling of a pastor and this is the calling of the local church. This is who Grace Chapel has been, and by the grace of God, this is who we will be long into the future. So that said, may God continue to give this body of believers the courage, the boldness, and the love and compassion that we see in the life of Stephen, the sacrificial love that he displayed that was first displayed in the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ, in whom we place all of our hopes for all things forever, amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the beautiful picture of you in the life of Stephen. God, that he was willing not just to proclaim the truth, but to live it out with his actions, to literally lay down his life for the sake of the gospel and lay down his life out of love for his enemies. God, I pray that those things that marked Stephen and those things that marked the early church would continue to be true about this family right here. God, continue to do your work in us and through us. Heal us. Heal us, God. Make us whole so that we might be able to walk together in unity on mission for the cause of Christ and for the sake of the gospel. Do this, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you soon. Take care.